So my name is Steve Smith. I'm a senior principal consultant in the test data management uh, group uh, in the continuous delivery. And today what I'm going to do is talk about test data management, but focus really more about how we you know, access things on the mainframe, IMS and DB2 in particular. Is that kind of like a, an area where you guys are coming from, or what is it you're kind of looking for here? Okay, okay. So yeah, any questions you have or anything, just you know, don't interrupt. Uh, I know the last session before the end of the show is always you know, kind of a hard one to get through. So basically, just for informational purposes only, so kind of the disclaimer slide that we have. When I uh, got this picture, I didn't realize we'd actually have a Z14 on the floor, so you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, takes away some of the, the excitement. But I had an earlier session where I was kind of demystifying the mainframe, and then I started off with the ENIAC. You know, it was uh, eight feet tall, three feet wide, and 100 feet long, and it weighed, you know, X number of tons. So just kind of contrast it with what, you know, we have currently now in the mainframe. But, you know, for people that aren't mainframe oriented, you know, you think about it, I mean, that's where I started my career. And, and it seems like my whole career, I, I've tried to get away from the mainframe to get onto the, the newer technologies and things like that. And I would have thought, I live in the D.C. area, and like in the early 90s, you know, the government agencies were saying, you know, by Y2K, we will not have any mainframes. Everything will be, you know, client server based, running on oracles and things like that. So 2017, I'm still talking to a lot of those same customers, and lo and behold, they're still running on the mainframe. And the thing is, it continues to evolve and mature. So with pervasive encryption, zero downtime, the concept of five nines in terms of, you know, up of capability, and moving it towards what they call the application economy. So this week, I know you've listened to a lot of what we have to say about our modern software fa uh, factory. But it really is a combination of, you know, with the application and the data and where it resides. And then as we start looking at new technologies, blockchain for business, the mainframe has continued to evolve and you know, still is really extremely viable in terms of what customers want to use to run on. You know, this is really a staggering number. You know, I, I hear in the number, you know, statistics 70%, 80%, but I also heard a statistic uh, a couple weeks ago that last year alone we accumulated more data than we had since the beginning of recording data in history. So in one year alone, if we've really already got that much data, but still 70 or 80% of it still relies on the mainframe, that's still a pretty staggering number. This one's kind of interesting too. Many organizations rely on copies of production for testing. In the last two weeks, I've had three customers that admit that when they move data out of production into non-production for testing, they don't mask it. You would think after things like Equifax and Target and all the breaches that we've seen, that that would be some point of concern for them. But the reason is they need to get the data into their test environment, but they can't do it in a timely manner by doing something like masking or subsetting or generation of data. They just don't have a means to be able to do that. If we look at data in a production environment, of course it's pretty secure because we have you know, security lockdown in terms of how and who can get to data in what places. So we think about data in production, Typically, most people don't have access to it unless their job really requires it. But as we move that from production down towards non-production environments, of course, we loosen the restrictions on that data so you know, more people can do more job functions based on lighter restrictions on that non-production data. But if it's still containing production data, then of course you have a risk of what you're exposing there. We also find, especially with a lot of mainframe legacy applications, they may not have the expertise to really know where their PII data is. I mean, their systems are so broad and so, so wide that they don't really necessarily know what it, where it is. What we've seen here, especially if you're dealing with uh, European data now, GDPR has become a big uh, issue. The fines associated with that and the reputation costs, if you aren't compliant with that over in the Europe, are pretty extensive in terms of what it would cost you as an organization. And once you're flagged once, then you're put on an audit list to, until you, know, you can prove that you're being a good corporate citizen. And tied with that, with GDPR, is also the right of refusal. So I, you have to you know, basically give permission that you can use my data, but then a week from now I can remove that permission as well. So a lot of compl complications. And then the cost of moving test data to and from a platform. Now you're going to see that the way we do it is we run natively on ZOS when we actually do our processing. Some technologies you know, reside on the mid-tier, so they have to have some form of communication up to the mainframe, they get the data that they need, FT, or not FTP it, but you know, transmit it during, you know, via some type of network protocol down to the mid-tier. 
do whatever they need to do and then send it back. So one is an extremely wide bandwidth of data if you're dealing with a lot of data that you're moving with. Two plus, it's something that's running on the mainframe that most mainframe system programs don't have control of. Because it's running like as a listener process like an oracle would. So if I decide, you know, uh, seven o'clock at night before I go home for the night, I want to download 100 million rows of data. Person on the mainframe is not going to be aware of it. And then of course they're going to see, you know, the CPU utilization on the mainframe spike in terms of what they're looking at. So this is a long version of what test data management is. I kind of compressed it down into uh, some more meaningful morsels that we can look at. So what we do we need to do to have the right data in the right place at the right time in the right format? These are really the steps that we need to go through. So we need to understand where the sensitive data exists. So we need some way to be able to profile that data. So we can profile that based on metadata, the physical data. We can also profile it based on the relationships of data. So we may or may not know the relationships of a you know, driving table to a child table to a grandchild table necessarily. Someone like myself, when I go in for a POC, I don't necessarily know the environment. I don't know where the sensitive data is, and oftentimes the customer doesn't either. So the ability to understand where the data exists and the referential uh, integrity of that data helps me be able to do that. That leads into improved um, test data regulatory compliance. So now I can identify where the data is. I can tar start to take proactive measures in terms of ensuring that that data is not exposed uh, as I move it into my non-production environments. Reduce data dependency from production. If we look at production data, most production data should be accurate. It should be clean. It should be free of errors. It should ha not have the anomalies that we need. But as we start to move it down towards an application testing perspective, we really do want data that has those anomalies, that's not clean, that's not precise, ed ca edge cases, uh, invalid test cases, and things like that. We also find that when we move data down from production, if we look at it from an application testing perspective, it's generally very spotty. We don't have a lot of coverage for the test cases that we need to test. So the whole process or concept here is how can we, even the mainframe world, start to shift this left so that the application people are getting the data that they need on a time basis that they need so they can actually test their applications. So kind of move that divide between the systems or the database administrations, allowing the application people to be able to get uh, to be able to do that. So how can we improve that test data quality, so get those ed edge cases and things like that, and the cost of associating of provisioning data. What we also see then is in the amount of time is when you move that data from production, move it into a non-production environment, once again the coverage is spotty. So then a, an application person needs to go out and populate that with the data that they think they, think they need to. Or they may find a set of records that works for them, but they need to be able to clone that because they want to test it more. Data also ages pretty quickly. So let's say you, know, you have a cycle where you get a monthly refresh or something like that. If you're testing something based on dates or things like that, you're going to basically burn through or corrupt the data that you're testing with. So as I update things, as I'm looking at certain criteria, as I have that data in my non-production environment, it's going to age. So what happens is then we take the production data, we move it down into non-production, we repopulate it with the test cases that I need to test case, and then we start to do it again. And we estimate that 50% of an application programmer's time is spent basically reprovisioning that data once it's been moved down uh, from production. So what we want to do as we do this is improve the test data availability. So once again, in that shift left, enable your application people to be able to do things. So if I come in on Monday, start testing my application, I've made my application changes on Wednesday, I want to really reset my environment. Let's do it in a way that allows your end users to be able to say, okay, I, it's time for me to reset my environment and I want to do it now. So once again, they can get through more test cycles in a shorter period of time. So the steps and, and part of what we're looking with in the tool then is the centralization or a common repository. So whether we're talking about you know, a, a relational source, non-relational source, mainframe, or whatever it is, test data management is a client running on a Windows server that is consistent in terms of how it approaches and addresses doing the different things that it can in terms of subsetting, masking, and generation. To get to that point, we want to discover. So what, what happens there is within the tool, then I register my data source that I want to look at, and then I start doing my profiling. So I'm going to look at the entity structure for it. I'm going to do a sampling of the data to see where my sensitive data is, uh, get a better understanding of what that data is. So I can then, as I move forward, leverage that information. 
I can subset based on a criteria that I want to do that. So do I need a full copy of my production in my non-production environment? Or if you're even doing a concept of where you take that production data, put it into a gold copy, from an application testing perspective, are there certain criteria that I need in my non-production environment to be able to do my testing? So we can subset that based on some type of criteria at any level within the table to be able to do that. So once again, I have a concise set of data in terms of referential integrity, but just maybe a smaller subset or a more focused subset in terms of what I want to test. Masking then, of course, is the ability to take that data, make it look like uh, real data, but just not based on production. So what I mean by that is, as if we look, talk to an application programmer, they're pretty knowledgeable in terms of what that production data looks like typically. But an application programmer shouldn't know that they're dealing with data that's either masked or synthetically generated because we need to maintain the, the data integrity. And by what I mean by that is, if I'm masking a first name or a last name, and I want to use that in a full name field or an email address, I want that all to be consistent as I do that. If I'm asking something like an address, I want to keep that address consistent. So if I'm keeping it, let's say, in the same geographical region, I want to make sure the city, state, zip, and all those match. So from an application testing perspective, it looks like what I expect it to look like. Synthesis, synthesizing data. So we, subsetting and masking, pretty straightforward. But what we're seeing with customers, especially with things like GDPR and some of the regulatory compliance issues that they have is, can I generate synthetic data in my non-production environment rather than rely on my production source? So when I move it from production, mask it, hopefully I've gotten all the columns that I need to, but do I necessarily know or can ensure that I did? If we look at synthesizing that data, we know that we're starting without the production source, so we're still generating that data, but generating it in a meaningful way. So once again, names look like they need to, email addresses, addresses, whatever information that you need to, but it's all synthetically generated to be able to do that. And the last part of it is being able to enable your end users to do things. So ba basically being able to automate the process so they can re refresh their environments when they want to. They can do find and reserve, so I need a certain set of test case data. I want to go out there and look and see if it exists. So I want something in the state of Florida uh, with the person with the last name Smith. I can go out there, I can find that data, but then I can actually reserve that data for my testing. So the next person that comes along and would request that same information would see a different set of rows, but not the ones that I've requested. I finish my testing, I can go back and release that into the pool, so then that data is back into the find and reserve. And then also to generate data. So the ability to allow your end users then to basically start that process as, as well. So once again, come in on a Monday, do their application testing. By Wednesday, you want to refresh it or regenerate that data. We can do that based on a portal looking things with tiles that are uh, created for your end users based on their role or responsibility to be able to do that. So when we look at it once again, it's a Windows server base where we install the test data manager. We can tie into our Agile requirements designer if you guys have seen any sessions on that. We also then have our test data on demand. So basically that's a portal that allows interface into the tool. So as an application person, they can come in and look at the tiles that allow them to do things like cloning, synthetic generation, resetting of their environments. But when we communicate to the disparate sources, we really don't care what it is or where they reside. So if we're looking at a Z series, you know, DB2 and IMS in this case, vSAM or sequential files or AS400, from a tool perspective, they're just sources of data. We understand the metadata that's associated with it. So when I start to create my masking rules or my generation rules, I can use that across the disparate platforms and make it look the same. Because let's say I'm masking data for an application that you know the primary uh, driver is Oracle, but it's going to do a lookup to a DB2 on the mainframe. I need to have that data on the mainframe match what I have in Oracle, so when I do that lookup, I get the proper return of information from the DB2 or the IMS system. So from an application testing perspective, it all looks the same. So centralized management that allows communication to all these disparate sources and underlying applications that reside there. So how does it really work? So once again, within the tool, I'm going to de define my subsetting, I'm going to define my masking, I'm going to define my generation, things like that. I'm going to take the rules that I develop and I'm going to uh, take them up to the mainframe. So basically, I'm going to create rules that define the structure of the data. 
uh, if we're looking at like IMS or vSAM, uh, sequential files as well. I'm also going to define my masking rules if I'm going to use them, and I put them into a PDS member on the mainframe. Once that's done, then I execute a batch job to then be able to do what I want, subset, mask, uh, you know, generate, things like that. Now the key here is once again, I'm bypassing that, that network connectivity issue of all the data having to flow from the mid-tier back to the mainframe and then back down to the, uh, the mid-tier to be able to do it. So by being able to run here, it allows me then to schedule jobs so I can use a scheduler or something like that. It's a batch job that's running. So really from a mainframe perspective, it's going to perform and it's something that's controllable versus something that's coming up from the network without any type of regulations or things like that. Does that make sense? So the way it would kind of work if we look at it, you know, pictorially, across these multiple sources, so this could be a combination of the sources we're looking at, we're going to be doing masking in this case. So I've masked my, my customer ID, my name, and my social security number. I've left my street address the same on both. But what we can see for the child table or the you know, referentially integrity of the data that we have there, I've changed the customer ID, but the item number is still the same. So once again, from an application perspective, even though the customer looks different and the order dates are different, the actual item numbers are the same. So from an application testing perspective, it's going to continue to work. So some of the keys when, when we do this is we want to be able to do it in a way that we uh, teams can share and reuse the engineered test cases. So what that allows us to do is if we look at the tool, we're going to create what we call a project. So it could be an application, it could be a data source you know, concept. Within that pr project, we have the ability to have versions. So let's say today I'm working on version one, I'm creating my masking routines and things like that. We already know that down the line we have a version two coming where I'm going to add some tables or I'm going to add some columns to some tables. I don't want to affect what I'm doing in version one, so I'm going to actually take the, everything that I've done in version one if I want, move that down to version two so I don't have to re-engineer it, but then I can take that and then start to add what I need to do for the new columns or new tables that might exist to be able to do that. If we start looking at it from the perspective of our end users, so once again from our portal, they can actually go in and start to reserve data that they want to look at. We have the multiple versions that we're working at. So the ability then to ripple that down through all phases of the test cycle that we want to. So once again, moving towards that agile world, we're going to have multiple versions of things going at, at any one time. So the first step that we're going to do then, once again within the tool, I'm going to register my data source that I'm going to look at. I'm going to then start to do uh, discovery on that. And we have a set of you know, pretty powerful mathematical based algorithms that are going to go out and find things like address, first name, last name, uh, credit card, phone numbers, you know, addresses if I didn't say it. We can also add to it by creating what we call filters. So I can create a regular expression, put it into the tool to look for something that might be unique in your environment that you want to be able to profile against as well. So we can take that information and then actually leverage that information from our profiling to be able to then, as we get into the step where we're actually doing masking and things like that, leverage the information that we got from our, our profiling. So once again, it's going to show you, when we tie that in with sampling, um, the range of values that we find in the sampling, uh, the percentage, the number of rows that re we researched and things like that. So fairly powerful in terms of what we can provide. If we start looking at things, especially like a, you know, a DB2 or a relational database, we're going to have a relationship of our tables and we need to maintain that integrity of the data because on the application side, we need all of our tables in the representation that we expect. So we're going to have a, a driving table or the parent table, we're going to have a child table below it, et cetera, down through the, through the thing. So when we subset our data or move that data into our non-production environment, we're going to get all the segments of data that we need to be able to do that. Now, when we do it automatically, if the primary key, foreign key relationships exist within the data source, we're going to pick those up. But we can also create logical relationships. So sometimes that, that logic is maintained in the application itself, not based on the database. So we can actually create those logical relationships to those other tables so that we once again maintain that, that entity. We can also then, oftentimes, you, know, you might have tables that are small or they don't change that you want to bring over in their entirety. 
we can put that into our, our model as well. So when we subset some data, bring those you know, subset of data across, but we can also bring the other tables we want in their full copy. So once again, on the non-production side, you're going to have a full copy of the data that you need to to be able to test with. Question always comes up, typically it's you know, in a POC, you know, how, how fast can you perform? So once again, you know, numbers really vary, but we do have some pretty high throughput in terms of what we see, but most customers say that looks nice, but what's it going to do in my environment? But just basically showing how, you know, some of the performance statistics that we get and add to that the fact that for DB2 IMS and, and vSAM uh, sequential files running on the mainframe, we're running natively there. So no network traffic, basically a batch job, set the prior priority of that class and you're free to go. We have over 80 built-in data masking functions, and there'll be a slide that talks a little bit. But what it allows us to do then is replace that with realistic, referentially intact data. And then it allows us then to start looking at things like compliance with GDPR and some of the other ones that currently exist, HIPAA and things like that. So what we would do in the tool then is we would look at the table that we have or the column that we're looking at. We'll bring that over, pick what columns within that table, the table that we want, and then start to add one of our rules. So once again, over 80 rules. One rule that we use quite a bit is what we call a list of values, or sometimes referred to as a dictionary field. So that's what allows me to maintain a lot of that consistency of addresses and names and things like that. Uh, create, uh, you know, create names based on gender. So female names, uh, male names, keep a percentage or a ratio of those types of things that we have. So it allows us then to create realistic data that we're looking at. And that's probably about everything that I want to show them on that slide. If we're looking at synthetic data generation then, very similar to what we're doing in terms of masking. So it allows us then to look at the, at the, the tables, look at the, the columns that we're looking at, and then be able to uh, create these rules very quickly. So within the tool then, basically look at the column of data you want, click in it, it shows you what rules are available, and then just a matter of, of configuring these rules. And a lot of these rules, once you create one rule, it's just a matter of copying and pasting them into the other areas. So even though you may have a lot of columns in a table, it's really a process that you can get through fairly quickly once you get used to it. A lot of times I'll put it into like a spreadsheet or something like that for common rules that I had and I can just cut and paste and get through it fairly quickly to be able to do that. And the last part is just kind of talking about our, our end user capabilities. So once again, we, you have a portal that you can bring up, a, a user can log into it. We go to the, what we call the service catalog to be able to look at things that they can do. So based on their role or responsibility, we show tiles of things that they can do. So uh, some of the things they can do then is like I say, reset an environment, find and reserve data, clone data. So if they find a, a customer ID or something that they like, they want to create 10 more of them to, for their testing, they can do that. So it allows them basically to go into the tool, move that process as we shift less to allow them to be able to do things on a time basis that makes sense for them. So if we look at it then, really we're looking at you know, one platform, providing the you know, referential integrity, the ability to profile and do uh, uh, PII discovery or sensitive data discovery. We use the native engines when, when we can. So in the mainframe, we're running as a batch job, but if we look at things like Oracle or SQL Server, we try to use what they have, maybe Data Pump for Oracle or BCP for some, SQL Server or something. Something that's running natively and should be very performant in terms of what we're doing. Seed tables then, once again, to replace values. We provide auditing so you can see what you've done, when you've done it, so what fields have been masked, and then just the ability to add things like find and reserve. What we see with customers is this, concept, is, is this concept of a gold copy. So it's really just a, a concept. It's not really something that we provide. And each customer is going to be a little bit different in terms of what that gold copy represents. Some of them want to pull it out of production, mask it, and put it into a gold copy in a production region. Some people might want to put that down into a non-production region. So it's really flexible in terms of what you want to do. They may actually subset into that gold copy. But typically, once the masking and, and or subsetting is done, this is where you'd start to do your non-production pulls from to be able to populate those environments for your testing. And then just showing how, you know, no matter what your source of data is, really just one, one uh, platform to be able to support all those disparate sources 
in terms of what we're doing. So what we're seeing is, you know, organizations are really moving more towards this. Uh, the budgets are increasing for it. And then the ability for us to really run directly on the mainframe is kind of one of the uh, differentiators that we have to be able to do this. So as I mentioned, you know, it seems like in the last couple of weeks, the number of customers that I've spoken to that freely admit that their non-production data actually is production data is, is kind of staggering. But I think as you know, especially the regulations, violations, and things that we see, it's really something that can, can't continue. But generally the challenge is how can I do that easily and efficiently and do it in a common way across my disparate data sources? So CA Test Data Manager allows you the ability to do that, yet leveraging whatever platform that we're running to, on to be able to do that. 